Thank, thank you, Vince. Uh, it truly is an honor and a privilege to be here today. Um, you know, and a lot of things that we do as a business and as an industry leader is giving back. So to Vince's point, if you have any questions along the way, please stop me immediately. Um, happy to share, happy to tell. Uh, there's a lot of things that I've forgotten over the years. I am getting older, as Vince said. You know, I'm pushing the other side of 50 now, which does concern me a little bit, and many of you probably weren't around even when I got in this business. But uh, my name is John Page, currently serving as the president of the Wells Far Fargo Complex in Philadelphia. I also oversee our international business development to date. And then we started a new business called Spectra Concert and Touring. So it's our entree into the concert and touring business, not to compete with the big boys like Live Nation and AEG, but primarily to serve a lot of the facilities that we have under our management arm and really take care of these folks because they don't get a lot of access to promoters and content. A lot of small communities around the United States, you know, Enid, Oklahoma, Muskegee, Oklahoma, Fort Collins, Colorado, places like that. Um, but for me, it's been, it's been a great ride to be involved in this wonderful business, the sports entertainment world. Um, not many people get to do it, you know, and I would encourage you if you do have an opportunity to do it. Um, I look back on kind of my formative years. Uh, I grew up on the West Coast, so every day was like this. You know, out of 365 days, 350 were like this, so it's always great to enjoy the warm weather. No humidity, no bugs, and no snow. Um, but uh, I went to college at the University of Southern California, was fortunate enough to play football there. Um, didn't know what to do, and I had the opportunity to take advantage of a postgraduate scholarship. So I earned my BS and MS in public administration, thought I wanted to kind of be involved in the city management side of things. Um, our campus in Southern California in LA and South Central LA, it's not as nice as Villanova. For many of you that know the area, it's, it's a little tough and rough. I wish it was situated in a place like this, but it certainly isn't. So kudos to you for picking the right place and uh, the right environment. But um, uh, after graduating from graduate school, I worked in the weight room for two years while I was going to graduate school. And again, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I know I knew one thing, I didn't want to work in a nine to five job. And we were close in proximity to the LA Coliseum and Sports Center where the football team played. At the time, the LA Raiders played there and the LA Rams had just vacated um, right as I entered school the year before to go play down in Anaheim. Uh, but the Sports Center housed the Clippers at the time. So it was a very vibrant complex. Um, I had an opportunity to interview for a job, used a lot of my connections within the athletic department because of some of those relationships and landed a job as an event manager, an entry level job at the LA Coliseum and Sports Arena. Um, at the time, the Coliseum uh, was going through a lot of uh, different potential changes, looking to upgrade the facility to really house the two prime sports tenants at the time, which were the Raiders, who had had a tenuous career with the Coliseum and also the Coliseum where they currently reside. You know, they left Oakland, came to LA, and then obviously went back to Oakland. Um, so a lot of upgrades, renovations, and there was a renovation that did, did take place in 1992 to lower the field about 15 feet, took the Olympic track out to really make it a much more intimate stadium, as intimate as a you know, 100,000 seat stadium can be for football. So a lot of diverse events, um, a lot of crazy events, soccer, uh, Hispanic events, rodeos, Latin dances, uh, car shows. Uh, so a lot of fun, a lot of interesting things, a great way to cut your teeth, small staff, so we all had a lot of autonomy. Um, had an opportunity to move to Philadelphia with the person at the time who was our regional vice president, Peter Luco who had a close personal relationship with Ed Snyder. And kind of backing up, Ed Snyder really is the father of private assemblage management, if you will. Um, he had the vision to really take what he learned at the Spectrum, parlay it into a venture, which is the largest private management company today called SMG. Um, our company called Spectra Venue Management is about half the size. We've got about 140 venues that we manage. Uh, they're in the 220, 230 range. So all in all, between the two of us, we control most of the privately managed facilities, not only in North America, but beyond. So we're very proud of our lineage with Ed. Um, Ed is also the founder of the Philadelphia Flyers, got involved in 1967. Um, it's interesting, 50 years ago, about a month ago, it's actually February 9th of 1966, he was awarded the Flyers franchise from the National Hockey League. And he leveraged all of his assets, went into debt, um, took a lot of risk, and was able to really parlay that into you know, significant wealth. He's one of the few men or individuals to parlay their, their um, interest in sports entertainment into real wealth. Most of the people have earned their wealth in other, other vehicles and they were able to come in and buy a sports team, kind of an ego buy. So um, moving to Philadelphia in 1993, um, it's, it's been a great experience for me. It's the best thing I've ever done outside of the college I chose and asking my wife to marry me, who's from Allentown, so I still have a local flavor here. But, uh, um, 
you know, this business is very exciting and very entertaining. So um, getting involved at the entry level is really the best way to jump into this. You know, most of you are obviously pursuing law careers, which I commend you. Uh, the lawyers have gotten me out of trouble many times and will continue to do so. But um, it's, it's a great profession. And I think the things that you can learn here and the practical experience you get from a person like Vince really carries over in anything you want to do in any facet, you know, whether it's facility management, whether it's an agent, whether it's a, a personal manager, you know, whatever it may be, or running a sports team, all the things that you learn and that base knowledge, nobody can take away from you. So all of it's very applicable to what does carry over into how you operate. Uh, much of what we do in the sports entertainment world is experiential. You know, every day is different. Anytime that phone rings, who knows what's going to happen? Anytime you have an event, who knows what's going to happen? You know, you get 20,000 people in an arena, 100,000 people in a stadium. It's a small city. So things happen. People get sick. People fight. People die. It's all happened, and you have to plan accordingly. But, uh, um, you know, my personal career growth, being involved at the entry level and having the ability to grow up, um, I owe it to a lot of different people. But um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of nights. It's a lot of weekends. It really becomes a lifestyle. But, um, you know, getting in, asking questions, really understanding how things work, making sure you understand the marketing aspects, the PR, the operations, the box office, the sponsorship and sales, the team side, all of these factors come into play, but you have to ask questions to understand it. And uh, I, I feel very fortunate to be involved with an organization that is very caring about how we all share information so that we can all really grow together because it's very competitive, whether it's on the team side, the building side, in the, in the marketplace, whether we're competing with the Phillies or the Eagles for events or Temple University, whatever it may be, all these things come into factor. But, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to really start at the entry level, get promoted, continue to grow, continue to do different things, run our facility in Philadelphia up until 2004, then jumped out to run our management company for the last 12 or 11 years. Um, when I got involved, we had um, you know, probably about 20 accounts and was able to help our business development team grow that to close to 140. Uh, great thing about not being involved in that, it's a lot less travel. You know, going to all these places across the United States, Singapore, we've got a venture there. Um, so there's a lot of things that go, go into it. But uh, for the most part, you know, I, I can't thank a, a lot of people for their tutelage, their mentorship to allow me to, to do the things that I've done throughout the course of time. So that's kind of my, you know, brief history and entree into the business. So about 140 buildings or facilities worldwide, right, is what you're talking about? Primarily North America. You know, we've got a uh, venture in Singapore. We've got um, um, Singapore, Macau, and Abu Dhabi right now, not including Canada, which as close as it is is still a foreign country. Right. So you've got to speak A and you've got to say things a little differently. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to put it into context. We'll do um, you know, anywhere from 220 to 240 events annually, and most of those take place from October through April. So it's a very condensed period of time uh, for us to operate. You look at a baseball stadium, which really is April through October. Hopefully they run a little longer. Football is, a, you know, you, you look at the seasonality of football, September through December. Maybe some playoffs, they bleed into January a little bit. So our business is really set up that way because of the touring model and the way the seasonality of the sports is. Hockey and basketball being our two prime tenants. And then you've got concerts and family shows and conventions and whatever comes your way. Yeah, we'll do, um, we have a great relationship with Feld Entertainment, who is the largest producer of really family entertainment. They do uh, Disney on Ice, they do Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, and then they have some splinter acts as well that kind of come off that. They do some Disney Live, some smaller theater type shows, and a few other things of that nature. Um, interestingly enough, they're Circus just ended three weeks in our venue, three weeks ago in our venue, so the elephants are done. There's no more elephants in the cir circus because of some of the PETA issues and the ethical treatment of animals. So they really acquiesced um, and taken them off. So it's going to be interesting to see how the circus does continue to, to thrive. But you know, obviously we do Villanova basketball anywhere from, this year was three games because of the NCAA requirements. You can't have more than that if you want your team to, to play in your region or your first and second rounds. <coughs> So that's always an interesting situation. We'd rather have more. Um, you know, worked with Vince many years on that with scheduling. And uh, concerts will do anywhere from, you know, 35 to 40 shows a year. Uh, the primary producer of those is Live Nation Entertainment. We have a, a very aggressive incentive deal with Live Nation just because of the volume, and they are the largest producer of, of live touring events. So um, 
that's kind of the mix. You know, then there's a, you know, a few one-offs here and there. We do a big um, women's event every September, Women of Faith. Um, and then there's a sprinkling and smattering of, you know, various activities, whether it's Monster Jam, a dirt event. Um, so there's other things that come into play throughout the season. You've had uh, the National Convention, right? You've got another one this summer. Correct. So talk about how unique that is in terms of the security, the length of it. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting. We, uh, we got in the mix in negotiating um, the Democratic National Convention. I'll start with that one approximately two years ago. So uh, the city of Philadelphia was approached by the Democratic National Committee. They thought Philadelphia would be a great host. We hosted the Republican National Convention in 2000. Um, we were a little apprehensive just because of what we learned and everything that we went through in 2000. It's a significant block of time that comes out of your calendar and we, we weren't sure that we really wanted to do it. Um, Comcast was a significant underwriter and also the city of Philadelphia because of the services that they have to commit, whether it's police, license and inspections, just a lot of the things that go into this are very time consuming and very complex. So nobody was really sure that anybody wanted to bid for it. So every, every time the DNC came, it was no, 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 no. Um, but at the end of the day, we put a bid in, we were still saying no, and then we ended up with it. So it was kind of an interesting dilemma. We really didn't want it, but now we got it, so we're gonna make the most of it. Um, it's a great event from a PR and exposure standpoint. Obviously, um, Governor Rendell, former governor of, of Pennsylvania, and a, and a big proponent and a big uh, person of all political, the DNC and, and Democratic, yes, correct, um, is, is uh, kind of heading the committee in the fundraising effort, working very closely with David Cohen at Comcast. So they were kind of pulling a lot of the purse strings within the local community to get the additional funds that are needed. Because it's, you know, it's north of probably $50 million to put a convention of this type on. Um, our building will be out of service from uh, May 28th through August 20th. So for us, you know, we need to be compensated. So we're able to negotiate a, a, a fairly, you know, what we would term fair deal. But it also allows them the opportunity to raise the funds necessary to do that. Um, so for us, it's really a cost benefit of what we would lose in the summertime. You know, which could be anywhere from six to eight shows. So we had to make sure it was really commensurate with the time lost. Um, May 28th through August 20th. So it's a big chunk of time. Um, it, it could be pushed back if the Flyers happen to make the playoffs. Sixers won't make the playoffs this year. But uh, I bet on that early on. Well, uh, do you, know, you guys know Scott O'Neill? Scott was joined us. Yeah. yeah, so Scott, I'm friendly with Scott, obviously. And um, last year they won 18 games. He was betting on 22 this year. So they're going to fall a little short unless they went out. So hopefully they went out and continue to build for the future. But. <laughs> there's, there's significant build-out, so from a, a technical and production standpoint, part of the, you know, the, the aspect of it is the definitive candidate. You know, when we, we did the Republican convention in 2000, George W. Bush was out ahead of it, so they knew who they were dealing with. So they were able to begin the communication process early with the Bush folks. So they knew what they wanted, they knew exactly what they wanted the arena to look like, how it would operate, the time of operation. So they kind of put it all together. This time, it's not that case. You know, so they're not sure. You know, they think it's going to be Hillary, but they're not sure. So they're really kind of you know, putting this together so that they can have enough flex flexibility built into the design elements to host you know, 25,000 people, primarily delegates, to come into the venue and hear the propaganda that the, that the, the parties put together and, and present during that week of time. Well, I, I mean, it depends on how you I think either way, you can't lose. I think, it, you know, from a, a political standpoint in the, the theater that goes along with it, it's more, I think it's more entertainment than it is political at this point, which is fascinating. I mean, it's really is interesting. And I'm, you know, I know just from experience that your security has increased dramatically over time, and that's definitely at the end of the level. An event like convention, is there <coughs> A lot of it, yes, a lot of it's out of our hands. Um, fortunately for us, uh, one of the gentlemen that's in charge, he's the, the special agent in charge for the Secret Service, was involved with us back in 2000. So he's a tremendous guy, has a great feel for the venue already, so now he's the head guy. Um, so we've been in constant communication, and he's, he's also trying to get a timeline developed so that everybody knows what we're dealing with with respect to security. So it is significantly greater than what we were dealing with in 2000. Um, you know, interestingly enough, you look at where our venue is located, I don't know if many of you have been by there, but it's right off of I-95. So 
from you know, the security perspective, compared to what we dealt with in 2000, they're now looking at blast zone, which you know, kind of makes you a little concerned when they're talking about things getting blown up you know, right next to your venue or somebody trying to do something from a terroristic perspective. So you know, they've come in and done their blast assessment and will you know, work with the Department of Transportation just to make sure that they you know, look at truck traffic during the prime peak events during the convention. So you know, all of this just goes into the planning process. Um, it's very intricate. At some point, they'll sweep the venue and we'll have to provide employees' names and IDs so they can vet the people that'll be staying and be involved with the convention. So there'll be a, a defined perimeter around the complex so that certain people can get in and get out, um, deliveries and, and whatnot. It's, it, it'll be you know, a semi-military zone around the complex probably for a you know, two to three week period. It's, yeah, it's a little bit of everything. Um, the, the Philadelphia Flyers deal and the 76ers deal, deals are pretty close. Um, we used to own the Philadelphia 76ers. We actually did um, a joint venture partnership with Comcast back in 1996. They had the opportunity to buy the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, Pat Croce was kind of involved in that transaction, brought it to Ed Snyder. Um, Ed Snyder sold his interest in the Spectrum, the Wells Fargo Center. It wasn't the Wells Fargo Center at the time and the Philadelphia Flyers threw it in this joint venture partnership. Um, Comcast at the time owned 66%, it owned the balance and was the managing partner. Um, so there were some legacy deals that carried over from the spectrum to the center, um, but essentially there's a nominal rent that's paid. Um, for the Flyers, for the Flyers and the Sixers at the time it was 10% of the net ticket proceeds, so it's your gross less taxes, and then out of that 10%, the building would pay for all the traditional then operating expenses. So your ushers, your ticket takers, your cleaning, your changeover, utilities, things of that nature. Anything outside of that, so if there was a, you know, a post event, a pre event, something outside the scope of a traditional game event, the team would pay extra. Um, with this transaction of the Sixers, it's been modified a little bit. Um, and the Sixers actually have a minimum rent guarantee to the building. And so do the Flyers. So if there's a lockout or a, you know, a labor stoppage, there's compensation that we get just to make sure that we can continue to operate. And, and, and uh, for, for us, it was really um, debt covenant issues, really our debt ratios and how things worked on the funding side when we did our deal back in 2000, or excuse me, back in 1996. So um, that's kind of how our big tenant relationships are structured. Um, our concert deals are a little bit different. Most of our deals are flat deals, um, and they range anywhere from you know, $110,000 a night up to $160,000 a night. So our deal typically is with the promoter, and the promoter is taking the risk. So then the promoter is paying the act to guarantee, and that can range anywhere from you know, $100,000 to a $1 million. And then there's a split um, outside of that. So then the act can earn more than their minimum guarantee. They can earn typically 90% of the net proceeds after all the expenses are paid. So if they're getting paid a million dollars, hopefully they sell all the tickets and they maybe will earn a million and a half. So the promoter's working typically for a, you know, a 10% margin for the most part. Um, as things have evolved, and it really started back in 1993 with Irving Azoff, who's really a big leader in the music business when he was getting the Eagles back together. Um, they had a tour called the Hell's Free Hell Freezes Over Tour and it was the first time tickets really got over $100. And everybody was really nervous. Can you sell these tickets? Can you cover the guarantee? Because it was the first time the guarantees were creeping over a million dollars. Um, proved to be wildly successful. I mean, from there, a lot of the acts you could see from 93 until now, everybody really started to push the ticket price. Um, so from our perspective, you know, it worked. It's a lot of money out of the market when you look at how many shows can really afford to do that. And then how much can the overall market really um, you know, look at what's taken out of the marketplace. You know, an example, we hosted a Bruce Springsteen show on February 12th, and when you look at all the money that comes out of the market for one night, there's about four and a half million dollars that came out of the market for one show. So when you look at the ticket gross, the food and beverage, the parking, 
service charges, all totaled, it's four and a half million dollars for three and a half hours. So it's not a bad take when you look at what's spent between the venue operator, the, the, the artist, the promoter, you know, the city's tax base, all that goes into play. So those are two examples. Um, a lot of our shows, like with Feld Entertainment, our family shows, the Globetrotters, a lot of those are co-promotions. So it's really some shared risk on sales. We do a lot of the marketing since these, tour, these, these events tour from city to city. So we really get actively involved to act as their marketing arm. Because of our relationships, our connections in the marketplace, we can leverage what we're spending on the flyers, what we're spending on other events. We can go to a newspaper, a television station, a radio station, and say, look, we're going to bring you you know, half a million dollars in spend, what are we going to get back in terms of promotion, points, and all the marketing initiatives that we need, trade, extra spots. So it's a real leveraging opportunity for us to maximize everything that we do. So all told, we really try to you know, look, at, look at how things operate and, and what we do. Um, you know, in that vein, as we would go out and sell a lot of our privately managed venues, uh, our big differentiator is we're a sales and marketing company because we know how to do that. And anybody can clean a building, Anybody can change a building over, but it's how do you drive revenue, how do you sell tickets, and how do you make yourself more marketable. But it's by having great marketers, it's allowing people to do the thing, but it's driving revenue so that the shows can make money when they come to your marketplace. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, there, there are times when we have a lot of contact with our general counsel or specific attorneys assigned to our various lines of business. Um, we've got, um, just to kind of give you an overview, we've got a general counsel. We've got uh, one person that focuses on venue management, one that's kind of really um, dedicated to the Wells Fargo complex with all of the transactions that we have. I mean, we have countless premium seating contracts, sponsorship agreements, so just the workflow and that person also liaises with HR. So a lot of our labor issues that go on, not only in Philly, but also out in the marketplace, whether they're union issues, you know, just plain old HR issues, terminations, whatever it may be, bad behavior, um, that happens. And then we've also recently added a person that's really deal with a lot of the technologic advances in the business, particularly with our ticketing company. You know, how do things work? You know, what can you do, what can't you do? There's a lot of things that get very complex on the technology side, patents, so things, you know, really changed in terms of the ebb and flow very quickly. Um, you know, for me, a lot just depends, you know, whether it's a kind of a unique situation outside of our typical license agreement. You know, I'll need some advice on different terms and conditions. It could be an insurance issue. You know, a lot for us, everything's pretty standard, and we've been able to negotiate. Um, you know, when you look at the standard deal points, it really comes down to indemnity in many cases. Um, you know, so what's the risk factor with respect to the indemnity provisions? So if somebody wants to tweak it, what's it worth? If they're not budging, we're not budging. I don't want to lose a show. You know, I don't want to lose the opportunity to make 250 or 300 grand over two words, which can change a lot, which is hard to believe. But you guys know that a couple words here and there, a paragraph change or a, a period change or a comma can mean a great deal. So um, quite a bit. I was just in London uh, last week dealing with uh, two of our attorneys, general counsel and our venue management person on our Singapore project. So we're negotiating with our uh, consortium member over a commercial rights dispute. Um, so we were in London for three days. And then we're going to New York next week to hopefully continue that and get a resolution. So some days more than others. Um, but they're, you know, they're a great resource. Uh, and we're very fortunate that our people you know, aren't just really letter of the law, which you need sometimes, but they're also <coughs> business people. You know, they understand how the business works, what the pros and cons are. And at the end of the day, what are we trying to achieve? What do I want to do so that he or she can find the best solution for us to cut a deal, get it contracted, and we're, we're putting the event on, the tickets are going on sale. That's the mantra of the owner of the law school. Is the law and business intersect, so it's a great example. There you go. I didn't see him up there. Before, other question um, before I forget. Talk about all the verticals that Spectre now has and, and how they all work together and, and their strategy. Yeah, we, um, Ed Snyder, 
as I mentioned earlier, was the founder of SMG. Uh, he took on two partners. He took on the Pritzker family, which is the Hyatt Hotel family, and um, Aramark, a local Philadelphia-based company. So Mr. Center decided in 1998 to divest his final third interest in SMG. So we had a two-year non-compete. We jumped right back in the business in 2000. We bought a small company that had five accounts. And when you threw the Spectrum and the Center in, we had seven, and we just started chasing it. So as we um, really went in at hard and heavy on venue management, we had an opportunity to get involved in minor league baseball. We bought three minor league baseball affiliates of the Orioles in Salisbury, Delmarva, and Bowie, Maryland. And with that, there was a small food company that came along with it. And as we looked at our growth and how things were going and the need for capital, particularly on the food side, uh, we sold our baseball teams so that we could really focus on food and management. We really saw those were the two benefits for us, that the, the cash flow from the baseball teams was great, but we saw the ability to get a greater return on our other traditional businesses outside of the sports piece, which at the time we were doing, we had the Flyers, the Sixers, we also had the Flyers American Hockey League affiliate, the Phantoms that were playing at the Spectrum. So with that, that was our, our really our two prime verticals. Um, in 2004, um, we took a good hard look at how are we going to really change our business dramatically and how could we control it. At that time, there was really one significant ticket provider in the United States being Ticketmaster. And we used to own a Ticketmaster franchise. We had the, the, the franchise rights to Delaware Valley. Um, the CEO back in probably, I guess it was 98 or 2000, or maybe 99, wanted to go public. So he was trying to roll up a lot of these franchisees that they had created in the country. There was one in DC, one in Philly, a couple others. So, um, you know, we saw some of the, the issues down the road with the control of the ticket. Whose ticket is it? Whose data is it? How can that be used? Ticketmaster was really being, they kind of drew a line in the sand that it was their ticket and they would just dictate to you how that would work, what the service charge would be, what the rebate. So we weren't really happy. So we bought a small company that was based in Scranton, Wilkesbury called Patron Solutions. So that was really our third vertical that we put in play. Um, our, our Ticketmaster agreement at the Wells Fargo Center was up in 2006. Um, and we were being courted by Packy Olin Technology, which is a California-based company. Uh, we decided to kind of go on our own. It's a white label system that's really based in enablement. So you can do whatever you want. You know, you pay a fee structure back to the ticketing company. You charge whatever you want. Service charges, you get the data, you do, you do ticketing however you want. So we felt great about it. Um, with that, we got a, um, a piece of the company, some equity in Packy Olin. Um, a few years later, Ticketmaster bought Packy Olin. And then when Ticketmaster was merging with Live Nation, they needed to create some competition. So we bought the company back basically for our 20% interest a few short years later. So Peter Luco, who was our CEO and chairman at the time, actually testified um, in court, in federal court, you know, just about the, the context of ticketing and creating competition by us getting that back. So, you know, our focus is, is the core of what we do from a sports and entertainment facility. It's management, it's ticketing, and it's food. And that's how we, how we really grow our business and, and focus on things. Not, not really. Um, I mean, th there was some significant discussion with them uh, throughout the, you know, the bid process about what could happen. Um, event schedules, you know, we talked to the Eagles and Phillies prior to getting it that they would need, you know, they couldn't, the Eagles would be in training camp. So if they were going to do something, they had to kind of scale it down. And the Phillies were out, of, they were going to be out of town. So it worked real well. So the, the crossover on parking, we have about 6,000 parking spaces on our side of the street. So really up until the last few weeks, we should be able to accommodate parking and, and our tenant relationships and, um, and our relationships with the teams are, are just fantastic as well. It's, it's a big fallacy. Um, you know, really, the, the control, 
at the end of the day is with the act. So the act is the one that really dictates how many tickets are held. Um, obviously, when you look at what a building has control of or wants to push, it's our contractual obligation, primarily to our premium seat holder. So if they've got a contractual right, and our facility is all private, you know, it's privately financed, it's privately held, um, albeit it's part of a big corporation being Comcast, you know, there's a lot of people that think all these tickets are just being sat on. But the, the real problem is some of the access and the, 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 the bots and these computer generated systems that are, have been created to go into a ticketing system when the on sale happens to gobble up tickets. Like if you go on some of the secondary outlets, whether it's StubHub or Razor Gator or whatever it may be, Ticketmaster Plus, TM Plus, <coughs> you'll find in some cases people are listing events that the tickets aren't even out there. They're just making up locations because they can. There's nobody really prohibiting them from doing that. And they don't have, they're hoping they get something close. So then if you want to transact, then you have to kind of go on there and trust that you're going to get a good ticket. We just had a situation at Springsteen where uh, there's a syndicate out there that was counterfeiting Springsteen tickets. So the FBI came in, um, you know, we had 300 plus tickets that were caught because of the barcode capacity capability of limiting that. They pulled the people aside and most of the people were buying tickets through Craigslist. So it's a kind of an unauthorized opportunity that was portrayed to them that was legit, wasn't. They're out the money and they're trying to catch the people. But um, Adele was you know, probably the hardest negotiation I've had in my career in, in terms of um, it was a cut, it was a death by a thousand cuts. Like every day was something different. And I, I should have never done, I should have just put my foot down. But I think we ended up with probably the best Adele, Adele deal, deal in the, probably the United States. But um, they didn't want us to have any seats for our premium seat holders or for our owners. So I'm like, you know, we can't, that can't happen. I mean, so it was a, it was a big dog fight and we ended up with very few tickets compared to what we typically can get. But we don't hold our tickets for anybody but our specific clients. So it's not like we're selling them out on the secondary market and most venues don't. I can't speak for all of them, but it's, it's, it's a legitimate business and there's just so much demand in some cases. Like a Springsteen show, one show in Philly, we could have done six. So everybody wants to get to the one show and it just drives everything up. And then the secondary market really dictates what that market price will be. So, you know, it is America, it is capitalism, and fortunately it does work. When you say that's a tough negotiation, It was a little bit of both. It was um, because of the complexity, the promoter really got out of it. So I was dealing directly with the agency. So it was an, an agent out of William Morris Endeavor. Yeah, we do. We do. There's, you know, we probably deal, you know, I probably have, I don't know, 35, 40 agents that I deal with. Um, so there's different, you know, the way they set up, there's responsible agents and sometimes there's regional agents. So depending on how they're doing the tour, they'll, they'll try to beat you up many different ways and take your money from you. And that, I mean, I think you're all familiar with WME and the way they present many of the large yep. acts in almost every genre of music. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You've got really two big players, you know, CAA and WME. And then you still have a number of boutique people out there. And um, you know, the boutique guys have been around forever and they're a little cantankerous at times, but if you have a relationship with them, it's, it's a fantastic business. Like the guy that does Jimmy Buffett, uh, just a great guy. Uh, Billy Joel's guy is a great guy. I mean, a lot of these people, they're just really focused on who they have. Actually, the guy that has Billy Joel, or excuse me, Jimmy Buffett also has Elton John. So that's all he does is Billy, uh, Jimmy Buffett and Elton John. So. If you ever need a date, I keep trying to get a date of uh, Buffett in the building and I can't correct that, not yet. He still likes playing over in Camden, which it's like it's Camden. It's not Philly. And um, just go back a little bit. At one point, you had the old Spectrum mm -hmm. and the new center operating simultaneously. Correct. Uh, how many dates collectively? I mean, that, that may have been the busiest yeah. venues in the world. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, from really 96 until um, 2008, 2009, we would do 330 events a year. The Spectrum really became a weekend venue, really Thursday through Sunday in many cases. It served as the home of the American Hockey League team, which was a weekend league, um, but then we would put other shows in. I mean, when we closed it down, the, the tribute, you know, we had Pearl Jam, uh, we did an Earth, Wind & Fire show, we did... Uh, some uh, Bruce Springsteen shows, 
So from a, um, an artist perspective, it was a very, very revered venue. They loved the acoustics, they loved the intimacy. It was an easy building for them. So it was just, it was just a great facility. It was sad to see it get torn down, but it was really a, an economic proposition because of the costs that we needed to put back into it from an infrastructure perspective. I mean, it was falling apart, just everything. Yep. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Paul, I saw, um, I'm a master's student in, in our program here, and I worked in athletics, and I'm currently do work in athletics, and I worked with Jenny in the past. Um, my question was, early on, you mentioned that getting the experience at the entry level is very important. Can you talk about maybe some of the opportunities that you turned down along the way? Like, how did you know what was the right you know, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, as I looked at the direct path and where I wanted to be, you know, once I got my foot in the door as an event manager, I saw the various opportunities, whether it was in operations, marketing, but really what I wanted to do was run my own building. I wanted to be the person in charge, to have all the responsibility, really push the, the initiatives and the agenda forward. So um, for me, it was just continuing to ask questions and then work with all the other department heads to gain knowledge. How does this work? Why do you do that? How do you book a show? How does a concert deal work? Um, you know, wh why did you buy that radio station instead of this radio station? Because at the end of the day, you know, like I like to refer to, a general manager generally manages. You, you know a lot about everything. You may not have all that specific knowledge, but it's, it's really getting a good sense of how things work. You know, I think it's, it probably has a lot of, uh, um, similar relationship with law you know in some cases you know a lot about everything but you will specialize at a certain point and that's what we try to do with our people as we grow our business and really be successful particularly on the the managed side where we've got we may have a general manager that's got a marketing slant so our assistant general manager may be somebody that's more operationally oriented so it's really pairing people up so that you have that right person in place and that's what I try to do and what I've done getting back on this side of the business in July is really building a team that can support a lot of the things that I'm doing because it's more than just managing day to day. I still have some additional responsibilities just to keep that big behemoth running um, and driving the revenue that we need to support the teams and the rest of the operation. I think so. I think they do. I think, um, you know, when you, you look at the dynamics of what's there, um, you know, unlike what happened in 84, and I was, I was, it was my second year um, at school in L.A., and our training camp, we were um, dislodged. We had to go down to Irvine, to the University of California, Irvine, for our training camp that year because the Olympics were still on campus. But if you, if you look at the changes, you know, with a lot of the events being at the Sports Arena, which was a 1950s building, uh, the LA Coliseum hosting track and field with zero amenities. Um, you know, if you can get the, with the new football stadium being built, there's just so many opportunities, and you can even add the track back in at the Coliseum. You can take it out. So there's a lot of things that you can do. But you've got the Staples Center, uh, you've got the Velodrome, you've got the home. Oh, I don't know if it's it's not the Home Depot, StubHub Center, I think, where the MLS team is, or maybe another MLS team. The Rose Bowl's been renovated. You know, there's just so many things that go into it. And I think, you know, the past success um, of, of the area and what happened in 84 and some of the other major events that they host, the Grammys, uh, the Oscars, just that, that Hollywood appeal, I think, really transcends well for the Olympic aspect as well. Um, you know, it's a huge hub, but I, I think they've got, you know, I think if they want to do it, they'll do it. They'll find a way to get it done. With Xfinity Live? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're a joint venture partner with a company out of Baltimore called the Cordish Company. So the Cordish Company uh, really has created this concept and niche to um, develop these, you know, bars, restaurants, and entertainment complexes in and around larger sports complexes. So 
They're in Houston, they're in Kansas City, they're in Louisville, uh, they're down in South Florida, you know, they're in Philly, and they're looking to continue to grow. So for us, um, part of the negotiated right when we built the Wells Fargo Center was to retain close to 400,000 square feet in development rights. So we've got parcels of land on our site where we can develop property. So the deal is, is, is great for us. And you know, up until we got the Xfinity, X, Xfinity Live built five years ago, we couldn't find the right partner or the right concept. Um, so we knew the time was right to get the spectrum down, and it's just been, it's been a tremendous relationship. Um, it's all event-driven. You know, we thought it might be more, that the community, particularly the South Philadelphia community, may come on a more regular basis for lunch or dinner, but that's really not the case. So when we don't have an event, it's, it's, it's tough. You know, we may do three, $4,000 a night, but on the weekends, we really do well. Um, or a Flyers game or a Sixers game that's well attended. So it's, it's taken off. We're in the midst right now of, of analyzing phase two. What does that look like? Is it a hotel? Is it additional concepts? Is it restaurants? Is it office space? You know, what is it to make it click so that we can drive a, a additional revenue to support you know, not only the Wells Fargo Center, but the Philadelphia Flyers as well? But it's been great. And that company is also partners in the new casino project, which will be right down the street. Um, and they're partnered with Parks. Cordish is partnered with Parks. Um, it's hung up in the state Supreme Court right now over a ruling and appeal that's been filed. So they hope to get you know, the nod that, that goes through and they can begin to, to develop and build and really transform. Any of you that are familiar with the old Holiday Inn site, it's still a Holiday Inn, right off of uh, Packer and uh, um, like 11th Street. You know, there's a lot, well, there, you know, um, Madison Square Garden, they just spent over the last three, well, it's last year, I mean, they spent a billion dollars, not a, a billion dollars renovating the place, and they did a fantastic job. I mean, and it's New York. There's nothing like New York. It's got a lot of flexibility. Uh, it's always busy, you know, and some of the design concepts that they put in there are, are mind-boggling what they did. You know, outside of that, I still think with what we've got that's 20 years old, you know, it's hard to compete, you know, with the marketplace and, and the design that we have. Um, you know, everybody wants to play our building, which is great. It's a must play, which is good for us. And we try to be fair and balanced when we cut deals. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I think, I think we're one of the, you know, top few buildings in the United States and beyond. Um, I tell you, uh, Red Rocks out in Colorado is, is, has anybody been to Red Rocks? It's a, it's built into rocks. It sits, you know, close to the Rocky Mountains and it's, it's, it's really surreal being there. Just the setting, the, the dynamics of it, um, you know, just, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Uh, but it, that's, it's a really amazing venue. Um, but there's some old iconic venues out there like the Hollywood Bowl. Is a really unique setting that's really designed for orchestra events, but they do allow other acts. Like I saw when I was living in LA, I saw Jimmy Buffett there, which was great. I do remember most of the show. <laughs> but back, um, in back in my younger days, yeah. <laughs> I was probably in bed a little past midnight that night. But um, that's a great one, you know, the Greek Theater. We actually um, manage a property in Saratoga, California called the Mountain Winery. And it's, it's an old Paul Masson winery that a group of individuals bought, um, put some significant dollars in and renovated. It's, it's a 2,500 seat outdoor amphitheater that'll do, they, last year um, from May until uh, October, they did 70 concerts. And it sits um, up in Silicon Valley, overlooks all of Silicon Valley, and it's just a, it's a dynamic venue. It's, it's, it's lights out as well. So, you know, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's the intimacy, um, you know, the feel of it, the energy, and, you know, I'm, obviously a big fan, but our building when you've got a big event, you know, whether it's a Bruce Springsteen or uh, a Flyer playoff game or a Sixer playoff game or a big Villanova game, it's, it's, there's a lot of energy in there. You may not be able to identify one, but what's the toughest ticket that you ever had to deal with in your career? Uh, or opinion? For me to get, personally? No, just more, the most requested. Um, well, we, our venue in Glendale hosted the Super Bowl last year, so that was a tough ticket. You know, we also hosted um, the Clemson, the BCS game this year, so that was a tough ticket. 
Uh, just recently, Bruce Springsteen and then Adele. Adele is probably the toughest ticket that we've ever had. So we've had waiting lists, and you know, most people think when you're telling them no that you're just kidding, but it's it's a hard no on this one. But even I'll tell you the funny thing. Um, two years ago, we had Disney on Ice was frozen. Most of you don't have kids, or maybe you have siblings, or I mean, Frozen was crazy. Everybody wanted to come down and see Disney on Ice Frozen, and um, from a, a revenue perspective, we'll typically do, for a normal run of Disney, from right around Christmas to a little after the first of the year, there's 22 to 25 shows, and we'll gross anywhere from three and a half to four and a half million. For the Frozen run, we did over $10 million, which is like crazy. I mean, it was, I mean, Frozen's like a rock star, so it was, it was fantastic business, but uh, the demand for that was just unbelievable. What, what I find is it's the, the tickets that are in most demand, whether it's when a parent wants to get a ticket for their kid or it's a grandparent trying to get a ticket for their kid because you'll do anything for your kids, just like your parents do for you. We'll do anything for you. Put you through law school, right? No? <laughs> Some of them. Some of them. Sure. You can leave out the names if you have to, or any sort of crazy concerts. Or yeah. Well, we, um, yeah, back in the late 90s, we were approached by Metallica, and they wanted to promote a new record release, and they wanted to do something unique, and they asked us if they could use our parking lot, and they wanted really unfettered access, unlimited control, so we were amenable to it. Um, our PR guy, who will remain nameless, kind of got ahead of himself, um, agreed to it before we really knew what was going on. So the ban was in motion by rolling out these plans. Um, the city really wasn't aware, and the neighborhood wasn't aware either. Uh, long story short, we wanted to do the event. Um, and we ended up in federal court. And there was injunctions filed. It was, it was crazy. You know, I spent, myself and my boss, Peter Luco at the time, we spent three or four days in federal court going back and forth, and we really didn't want to win. We wanted to lose so that we could have the show. So there was a balance in trying to make sure that, you know, we fought the fight. Um, it worked out well. We ended up doing the show. So we had to somewhat control it. We had to give out tickets. So we limited it to 40,000 people on the east side, the football stadium side of our, our facility. Um, and it was a great event. We actually had a hockey game that night, and one of our players was finished, and he ended up being finished because he went to the show and shouldn't have gone to the show. But, um, uh, that was a great experience. Um, you know, a few years after that, um, we had two Guns N' Roses shows. That um, One was at the Spectrum and one was at the Center. We had one Friday night, which was at the Center. The second was Sunday at the Spectrum, and the Friday night show was sold out. So we weren't too worried about that show. We were worried more about the Sunday night show because we had about three or 4,000 tickets left and open <laughs> to convert. And um, Axl Rose had been kind of going through his you know, manic, showing up, not showing up. Instead of going on at nine, he's going on at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. So again, we weren't overly concerned about the first show. Uh, had extensive planning with our security department, our operations department, the city of Philadelphia, the police, LNI, everybody. So we had a buttoned up, locked up security plan for Friday and Sunday. So Friday night, uh, I never forget, I was walking around, we were getting ready to open doors, probably a little before that. Um, and I get a call from the promoter rep. He says, hey, we got, you know, we think maybe a little situation, not that much of a situation. Axel had gotten into an argument with his band members the night before, and he played Madison Square Garden, and he's still in New York. Um, and they can't get him to come out of his hotel room. So it's like, okay, well, it's still early. We still have a couple hours. We can get him here. So a half hour later, same thing. They can't get a hold of him. He won't answer his manager. So time's clicking off. So we open doors. We get people in. Um, so we develop a plan. To, we rent a helicopter and the helicopter flies from Philly to New York on an adjacent building. So it's up top on a helipad, and they're trying to get Axel out of his room. So all he has to do is come out of his room downstairs to the other building, up, boom, he can be in Philly in like 35 minutes, no problem. Well, he doesn't show up. So now we're having an argument, well, who's gonna cancel the show? So there's a lot of yelling and screaming, some F-bombs here and there about who's gonna do what. Um, so we tell the promoter, you got to go on stage and cancel the show. 
So we go on stage, cancel the show, and a riot ensues. It's bedlam, complete bedlam. So fortunately for us, I mean, we, we had some significant damage to the building. We had about, call it $300,000 worth of damage, but the band suffered a lot more because the fans just turned on all the axe equipment. So the mix, the sound mix, the light mix, all the demo, I mean, the um, demo racks, everything that was on the floor, they just destroyed. So we get them moved out, but that was a, a pretty significant undertaking. We had a Flyers game the next day at 1 o'clock. So regardless of all that, the show Sunday did not happen. So that was kind of the end of Axel for a while, but he's back out. So, you know, it goes to show you in this business, people have short memories. And, um, you know, just because you get in trouble doesn't mean you can't survive and live another day. That's what I've learned in this business. It's crazy. If you do a bad job or if you do a good job, people forget and you can be off to the races and doing something different the next day. So those are two good examples. That was old school. Yep. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Well, the, the business has changed. You know, I mentioned the Eagles um, situation in 93. When you look at the dollars, you know, before we would argue, even when I got in the business, you would argue at settlement over $400, you know, maybe it was a gallon of milk at catering. Well, today the dollars are so huge. Everything is such a business. Everybody's professional from the road crew to the tour manager, the tour accountant. Everybody's got a job to do, and their job is to do it to the best of their ability and get from one city to the next. I mean. When I started in LA, um, we did a number of international soccer events and we had an event, we walked up close to 30,000 people one night. I think it was El Salvador versus Mexico. So, you know, based on our deal that we had with the promoter, we had a lot of cash and he wanted to take the cash with him. So our um, person that was in charge of the stadium, our assistant general manager, left. So he was at home. So we owed the guy like $750,000. And I was sitting on close to half a million dollars in cash in our box office. So he wanted to take some of it with him. So I agreed, I called our, my boss and said, hey, what do you want to do? He says, well, if he wants to take it, give him some of the money. So I gave him close to half a million dollars. We counted out. I put it in a brown grocery bag and he wants me to walk him to his car. Now I'm a big guy, but I grew up in South Central area going to school. I said, hey, buddy, there's no way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up the gate. I'm going to close the gate as soon as you walk out. And I'm going to lock the gate and good luck to you. So he made it, but he's walking around. But we had acts that would take cash. A lot of our Hispanic acts, they would put in their drum kits and zip up their drum kits and go back to Mexico with some of their money. So that was the wild, wild west back then. Yeah, it's changed. It's changed. So um, the legendary ride, concert ride, right? Do you guys know what the rider is? Or it's the, you know, the things attached to the formal agreement You, you do. Yeah, you do. There, there are some quirky things in there. Um, you know, there's an act that we had in September that needed, needs a um, pristine toilet seat. So whatever room you per put the act in, you have to have a, you know, what they term as a hermetically sealed toilet seat for the act to use. So we have to go out. We've done it a number of times. You go out and buy the toilet seat. You put it down. They check it. So it's got to be, you know, a virgin toilet seat so to speak, but there are some things that still exist. Um, but, you know, the acts, they're, they're talented individuals and, you know, they want what they want. They like to be comfortable. Um, you know, and for them, it's, it's their livelihood. But you know, there's been issues. I mean, you know, again, back in the Spectrum days, our caterer was trying to be funny and he gave a rum cake to Aerosmith and Steven Tyler, it was a real rum cake, so it's got rum in it. And Steven Tyler and, um, um, Joe Perry were, they were just coming out of rehab. So that wasn't good. So that was a, that was a tough night, but we got through that one as well. But we, we made the caterer pay dearly for that one. But um, he was just trying to repurpose the cake from the night before. But, uh, but you know, that's, it's just, it is, it is unique in some cases, but most of them are real easy to deal with. Um, you know, they want to come in, they want to do a great job, and they want to get out and, you know, leave the fans with a, a real good feeling for what occurred. Mm -hmm. I've seen some 
fans in particular sort of push back on those types of things, mostly against Christian exploitation? Correct. What's the sort of lay of the land in terms of regional customers when you buy a ticket, what those seats are, where they go, and you know, the general acceptance of those things? Yeah. Um, so typically when you purchase a ticket online or over the phone, I mean even at the box office in some cases today there's an order fee, um, there's a service charge, so those are kind of your, your primary fees and there's also, there may also may be a facility fee. So a lot of those fees can be shared with the promoter, could be shared with the act. Um, some may be municipally mandated that a facility fee is charged as an offset for facility maintenance in the future, it could be for some capital act. Cap, cap ex expenditures in the future. So it could go to you know, new carpet, uh, new seats, um, just maintaining the facility overall. So in some cases they may be dictated by a governmental body on how that fee structure will be managed and how it will be set. Um, in some of the bigger buildings like ours, we try to be as fee friendly as possible. Um, you know, in many cases the bands do have requests based on certain ticket prices that they need the fees to be in line with their ticket price. We've got an act we're trying to confirm for, you know, it could be seven shows in March of next year that um, is really fee sensitive. And, you know, for us, if we're trying to do seven shows, we want to be fee sensitive. And their ticket price is low. It's going to be, you know, be no more than all inclusive with fees, you know, no more than $80. So it's, it's a real interesting dynamic when you get somebody that really cares about maximizing their exposure and doing right by the fans. Some acts don't care. You know, they're charging $450, they got a great production, and they, it, it's, it's money for them. Some just like to work and they need the money, and that's what they're doing. And, you know, a lot of this is really being driven by the change in music. You know, the acts now, the only way they make money is to tour. You know, before, back in the 70s and 60s and in the 80s, the model was different. They sold albums, CDs, records. Now they don't do that. I mean, it's a lot of downloading, it's online. So their ability to earn money isn't you know, isn't there. Maybe a little bit on publishing, could be sponsorship, but primarily their, their livelihood is really predicated on the ability to tour and sell tickets. So, you know, that's where I think you'll even continue to see more participation with the act in the secondary market and a lot more sensitivity on how you, you really set up your pricing methodology. So if you flex prices as you're going on sale, what's selling, what's not selling, so that you can really sell through in a real quick manner. Um, uh, you know, we, we have, you know, and it's interesting because we, we, with our ticketing company, they serve, you know, 120 of the top Division I college athletic programs, so there has been a shift, particularly on the student side to get the students to be engaged. You know, it all comes around your phone. So for us, we just put in, you know, in excess of $2 million to have a state-of-the-art Wi-Fi system so that you are connected, so that you can do all the things that you want to do to stay connected, whether it's via social media, to get replays, um, and you know, for us, we haven't seen that shift, but I view it, we're competing with the couch. You know, you got a great flat screen TV at home, your refrigerator's close, your restroom's close, you're typically not fighting with 15 other people to get a hot dog quick or whatever it may be. So depending on the venue you're attending, these are real issues. So we as venue operators and venue owners and team owners need to be sensitive to that. Um, you look at what the National Hockey League's done with their app. Um, really, we started at a local level we were trying to get in the app business, really the Wi-Fi delivery, delivery, and then having a lot of these other tangible things that you can touch and feel and make the fan experience better. But Major League Baseball, who's done a tremendous job on the baseball side with their, their BAM initiative, um, they came in and, and put an unbelievable offer to the National Hockey League. So instead of choosing Comcast, NBC, Universal to do a lot of that and maybe get an extension on their TV rights for the National Hockey League, they went with Major League Baseball because they had a better mousetrap. So that's, you'll see that start rolling out if you're hockey fans. You'll see a lot of the app advertisements start to come out. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's that internet interaction and connection to, you know, how do you keep people engaged when they're in the arena for what's going on, 
in the game, just other than what you're seeing, but also the ability then to really maximize your, your, your device that, that you have with you. Correct. Correct. Because, yeah, for us, it's all about data. You know, that's, that's what we want. We want to know who's buying our tickets so that we can get back to them, because that's what it's all about. I mean, people, you know, traditional marketing is it's hard to do these days. You know, to go spend a ton of money on TV, radio, and print, you're kind of pissing money away, or, you know, at the end of the day. It's, it's that, that specific targeted audience, and that's why we believe in what we're doing on the ticketing side with collecting data so that we can have the touch point and figure out who's in the building. Nothing. Go back to SLA. So, uh, Billy Cutter's an amazing model yep. here. And you evolved with this piece of the database. So, I mean, one hand, so, um, kind of what was that process like to consider this a goal of the team? What kind of goes on in the event um, for it to be on a piece of the SLA? Well, Vince, and Vince can tell you it's, um, <laughs> it's a bid. And it's, it's, there's not a lot of flexibility in the deal structure. You know, if you want it, you really get what you get. So there is a way that you can kind of talk through some of the other revenue streams that may benefit them. So if there's a way that you can make them more money, you can present that to them and hopefully they'll listen to you. Some of their, um, I don't know what you call it, their, um, the way they're sectioned off, whether it's wrestling, the Frozen Four, some of the other events have a little more flexibility, but the basketball group is pretty well defined because of the platform and who they are. I mean, they're, there's nothing quite like what they've developed in terms of a marketing branded, you know, showstopper for those three weeks. I mean, it's the first and second round, second and third, and then the final four. I mean, that's, that's the pinnacle of attention for that Thursday through Sunday. And uh, they, don't, they don't have to negotiate because people will give them whatever they want. Um, so the local schools, we've kind of rotated through the process here. Everybody gets a crack to be part of that bid cycle, to be the host, if you will. So this year's LaSalle. Um, so, you know, it just depends on how that works and, you know, we do our best. You know, the Lincoln Financial Field's got lacrosse again. Uh, we've done some other stuff at, uh, just changed names, PPL Park, where the union play. But, um, you know, those, those tournaments have a little more flexibility built, built into them. And some of them have a big fundraising component, too, um, above and beyond just what you see, you know, in the marketplace. We had that with the Frozen Four to host. We had the Hobie, Hobie Baker Award. We had to do a dinner. You know, it's a real athlete, student athlete experience, which you know is what it should be. I mean, it's all about the student athletes. You hosted over the years, NCAA tournament, women's final four. Frozen yep. Four. I mean, we've had, yeah, we've there. had everything. Yeah, we've had everything. Well, the Spectrum had uh, the Christian Leitner moment back in '92, and from that, I wasn't here, so. But we were put on um, technically double secret probation, times like four. So it took us until 2000 to host another NCAA event because there was an issue with phone lines and people weren't storming the court. So the spectrum was, was kind of removed from the ability to bid on an event. So I hosted, um, with my boss, we hosted an event in LA, the Women's Final Four in 1992. So we were able to kind of get to know a lot of the committee members got in good graces and we were able to get back in the mix. So we hosted the Women's Final Four in 2000, then had a regional in 2001, but it took essentially eight years to get an NCAA event back. And we're on a, you know, like every two to three year rotation at this point. 